Well, I'm excited this morning. Are any of y'all excited? Yes. Are you excited because he lives? Yes. Are you excited because he lives, you live? Yes. Amen? Well, I'm excited about the message this morning, so uh, I'm going to just go ahead and get started. Is that okay? Uh, the topic this morning is the truth about the resurrection. And I imagine most of us think we know the truth about the resurrection, but I believe that there's some things about the resurrection that uh, even if we know them, we don't fully accept them or understand them or think about them consciously. And maybe I'm just talking about me, maybe I'm not talking about you. But I learned some things as I studied this week. And uh, I don't know if I learned them or just got a new uh, expression of it and a new way to understand it. But uh, anyway, uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, sure how many of us are going to really get there with it. But anyway, we're going to go for it. Okay. I don't, if I mess uh, with it, it's going to mess up right now. Yeah, it's really and how many of you know we yeah. really should do that? <laughs> yeah. but, but I think sometimes uh, the levels we don't understand the right. significance, all the significance of the here. resurrection. Well, like say, and we miss out on the main now. purpose and yeah. point yeah. of his life, which mean, is to save us from our sins. We get so focused on studying the person while he was here physically on earth. And study, and he, he taught us a lot of things, and we should try to follow his example. But his stay here on earth, if it stopped before the cross, yeah, at the cross, uh, it wouldn't mean a whole lot to us. Oh, okay. you know that it's the cross, it's the, the death, burial, and resurrection that, that gets us anything in eternity. And so I, I think that, that we need to, to focus more often than once a year on that. I think we need to to be more aware and more focused on that part of what it. Jesus yeah. did. So in, second, in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 12, it says, Now, if Christ is preached that He's been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith also is empty. How many of you know our faith is not empty? Okay? But, but I don't know that we know how much faith we can have. You know, everybody knows at least uh, some or part of the story of his life and his suffering and death on the cross and, and even about his resurrection. But, but the Bible says, wide is the road that leads to destruction and narrow is the path that leads to life. And, and I think that even those of us who are on that narrow path that leads to life can, can fall short of all the life that we, that we are due that, that God intended for us to have. And he just said He came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. But I think even if we're saved and even if we're on that narrow road or trying to be on the narrow road, I think we can miss some things due to lack of understanding and lack of knowledge. You see, my people perish for lack of knowledge. I mean, we can be His people, but we need to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed. And if you study and you're not ashamed, then you've got to understand some things that are going to give you more life. Okay? And that's why we're working so hard to get people interested in studying the Bible and we're having a Bible study from 9 to 10 on Sunday mornings. It's not just a plain lecture Bible study. It's we pick a topic ahead of time and everybody studies it and we come and uh, we all discuss it together. No one person teaches and lectures about it, gives you his opinion. We all get an opportunity to tell what we learned from those scriptures. And uh, next Sunday we start studying the, uh, the parables starting in Matthew. And you just read it, if you want to be a part of that, you just start reading Matthew and when you come to the first parable, you study it in depth. And you find out everything you can learn about that parable. Compare it to the other parables, compare it to other scriptures. And see what other people said about it. And see how much you can gain from that one parable. And if we come, and amazingly, everybody gets different things and we all Flush it together and, and, and we all get something out of it. But anyway, that's a free commercial. 
But uh, uh, my prayer is today that uh, that we'll hear and understand what God wants us to know about the resurrection, and and we can all really have a more abundant life because we come to a deeper understanding. Okay. So with that, I want to pray before we go any further. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that you love us so much. Amen. And I ask you to help us understand today how much you love us. At least understand more about it. I know we can't fully comprehend your love, but help us to understand more about your love today, Father, as we study your word. And as we listen to your spirit and your voice, Father, I just pray for your anointing that you give me the grace to, to bring this up in a way that the people can hear and understand. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, Jesus went from the, the Last Supper in the garden where he sweat drops of blood. He sweat drops of blood because he knew what his destiny was. He knew where he was going. His physical flesh body, which he, he gave up, being God to come and live in a fleshly body as a man uh, on this earth. He gave up his God powers for that season of his life. And he did that willingly. But uh, he went to the garden. And, and because he knew that, because he'd given that up, uh, drops of blood, that's how much he was concerned about what he had to go through. But he said, nevertheless, your will, not mine, be done. And then he went to, to this supposed court and trial. He went through beatings, he went through mocking, scourging, humiliation. Uh, and, and so he was, he was beat up so bad and, and tortured so much they had to enlist uh, Simon the Serenian to carry his cross for the, for the last part of the way. And then the crucifixion with the nails in his hands and his feet, the pain, the humiliation, uh, hanging naked, bleeding on a cross. You know, we see him with, with that towel around him, but they tell me that, that he didn't have anything. He was just straight naked, and, and that's humiliating. Uh, and and the, the bleeding from the scourging and the crowns of thorns and the struggling for every breath. Uh, and still, when he's up there, what's, what's one of the first things that he says? He says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Is that a loving God? Is that a loving Savior that can go through all of that and never, never speak a harsh word, never... Uh, Try to get back at anybody, never revile, just just father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And you know, shame on us so many times we get in those squabbles and we have trouble forgiving some people that we love, don't we? And then you don't really love them if you can't forgive them because when, when you love, you forgive. Amen. So we're going to start with Luke uh, 23, 32. Uh, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about. Uh, part of the crucifixion, and then I, I want to, to get into some, some other things. Uh, it's still related. There were two, also two other criminals led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right, the other on the left. And then Jesus said to him, he said, Father, this is a repeat. He says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. And the people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he's the Christ, the chosen one of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine, saying, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. Uh, I don't know if I noticed that it was in all three of those languages before, but, but it was written in language everybody would understand. And, and the Jewish leaders didn't like it. They tried to get them to take it down, but, but it was written so everybody could read it. And there was no question in what he said. He said, this is the king of the Jews. And the, the Jews got really upset about it. Take that down. That's not true. Well, they didn't know, but it is true. Amen? Amen. He's the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He's everything. In verse 39, it says, Then one of the criminals who hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you're the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you're under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, 
for we received the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Can you imagine yourself being punished for something that you didn't do? How do you act when you think that happened? He acted, he just said, Father, forgive us. Uh, then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. I'm going to have to excuse me just a minute. It's hard to preach with the money you know. Yeah. Sometimes when you choke up a little bit of money. Uh, he said, uh, Assuredly, I say to you, this day you'll be with me in paradise. And you know, we pass over that sometimes. And, uh, and, and when we do talk about it, I don't know if we fully, fully understand it. But, uh, you know, that's, that's the perfect example of how easy salvation is. And we try to make it hard. But it's not. All it takes to be saved is, is I mean, all this guy said was, he, he acknowledged that he knew he was the Son of God. He didn't think he had a prayer of being saved in case some of y'all are thinking, well, i got to get cleaned up and be better like the Word was. You know? This guy didn't have to get cleaned up and get better. He didn't think he was worthy to be saved. He said, at least just remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, he says, because I know you're the Lord. And, and Jesus said, this day you'll be with me in paradise. Is that easy or is that easy? He didn't do any works before that that we know of. He didn't, he didn't go to church, pray to anything that we know of. He was a criminal, an admitted criminal. And yet we worry about if God can save us. You can't get yourself ready to be saved, okay? You just can't. Anyway, let's go on. Matthew 27 uh, says, uh, verse 45, says, Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness all over the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthion. That is to say, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, one of the promises that we have from God is in Romans. It says, I will never leave you or forsake you. Nothing can separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Neither life, nor death, nor power, nor principalities, nor things above, nor things below. Nothing can separate you from the presence of God. Nothing. But yet, God forsook Jesus on the cross. You know why God forsook him on that cross? It tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. It says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ, Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And then it tells you why. For He made Him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. He made Jesus be sin. Jesus didn't, didn't say, give me your sin. It says, God made Him to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. And I'm going to tell you, it's the biggest deception in the world. If you come to Jesus, and you confess I'm a sinner, and you say, I want you to be my Lord and Savior. I want you to forgive my sins. I want you to live in me. And then we go around thinking that God sees us as a sinner, and that our bad deeds separate us from Him. That's the biggest deception in the whole world. Okay? Because it's a lie. It's not true. Once you come to Jesus, Jesus, God turned away from Jesus, so He wouldn't have to turn away from us because we were sinners. He put away our sin. We talked about it in the early service. He put away our sin by the sacrifice of Himself. And we've got to start getting that right. We've got to learn and understand 
that we are the righteousness. If we trusted Jesus and put away our sin and the fact that our sins put away, and it's not just you sin up to today. It's not if I sin tomorrow, I've got to do something to get forgiven for that. You're already forgiven if you've trusted Jesus because He put away sin on the cross 2,000 years ago. It was on Jesus. All of your sin, all of my sin, all of the sins of the whole world was on Jesus on the cross. And that's why God had to go. At that point in time, Jesus died a spiritual death. Do you, you know what, when it refers to death in the Bible, when it says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, the penalty of sin is death. That death is not the physical death of the body. That death is separation from God. That's spiritual death. And God looked away from Jesus while He was on that cross, turned away from Him, forsook Him. And at that moment, Jesus was spiritually dead. I believe it with all my heart. Otherwise, God couldn't look at me. Okay? Because, because if Jesus didn't take my sin, there's no other way I can get rid of it. I can't be good enough. In the old covenant, they had to make a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice for an animal, year by year by year by year. And, and every year they had to do it again because it wasn't good enough. But Jesus did it once for all. Uh, he made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. So Luke 23, uh, 44. Uh, now it was about, uh, and some of these are different, different, uh, the same, same topic, but in a different gospel from a different world perspective. Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened, the veil in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. It tells us in another place. And when Jesus Christ. Uh, and when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. So when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. And most of us know the story after that. Uh, this uh, man named Joseph from uh, Arimathea came and asked everybody, he was a wealthy man, he had a fresh tomb that hadn't been used, and it was near the place where the crucifixion was. So he went to Pilate and asked for the body, and, and he took him down, wrapped him in linen, and laid him in the tomb that was hewn out of rock where no one had ever laid before, which was all prophesied. And that day was the preparation day for the Sabbath that was drawing near. And the women uh, who had come with him from Galilee followed after. They observed all the tomb and where it was, and how Jesus was placed in it. And then they returned home to prepare spices and fragrant oils to come after the Sabbath so they could take care of the body properly. And uh, then we go to Luke 24. Uh, it says, Now, on the first day of the week, that, that's like today, that's like the first Easter, okay? Uh, he says, On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And they went in and they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He told us he was going to rise again. You know, sometimes we see the living in the wrong place among the dead. We need to be sure that when we're seeking Him, we go to where He's alive and where there's life and people that are, that are walking in life. Uh, but they said, He's not here, but He's risen. Remember how He spoke to you when He was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. They remembered his words, and then they returned from the tomb and they told all these things to the eleven and all the rest. And it was Mary uh, Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And the words seemed to them like idle tales, but they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling at himself how it happened. 
Yeah, we're going to go back to that verse I already read it in, in the first part there, 1 Corinthians 15 and 12. Uh, yeah, if Christ is preached and he's been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. And yet, you know, he is resurrected. But you know, he can be resurrected and living in this world and not be living in you. You have to get into a relationship with him. You have to come and invite him to be your Lord and your Savior before you get full advantage in his resurrection. Amen? And we're going to see to it that you get an opportunity to do that today if you have it. But look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 39. This is a few verses on from where he said that. Uh, he said, if he's not risen, our faith is in vain. And in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 39, it explains, it says, all flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another kind of flesh of animals, another of fish, and another of birds. I, I guess that kind of puts evolution into that, doesn't it? Hello? They didn't allow, there's different kinds of flesh. There's also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. So there's one glory for earthly things, and there's another glory for heavenly things. There's one glory in the sun, and another glory in the moon, and another glory of the stars, and one star differs from another in glory. Do you get the idea that God didn't make a whole lot of things just exactly alike? Look at your neighbor and say, you know, I'm not just like you. God made me unique, and He loves me the most. Hello? Of course, He's saying your neighbor, He loves you the most. But, but that's not right, because He loves me the most, okay? How many of you know God is not a respecter of persons? We have a little joke around here about I'm His favorite, and she thinks He's His favorite, and He thinks she's His favorite, but, but, but God's not a respecter of persons. If you understand Him and what He did for you on the cross, we are all His favorites. Every single one of us, you're entitled to favoriteship, if that's the word, okay? But we don't know it, we don't realize it, so we don't enjoy it. You've got to know what He did for you if you want to enjoy your salvation. And, and that's, I think, why He put me here was to preach that. But uh, anyway, uh, where was it? You were His yeah, favorite. Okay. I'm it. Okay, so also is the resurrection of the dead. That's verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, it's raised in incorruption. It's sown in dishonor, it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness, it's raised in power. It's sown in the natural body, it's raised in spiritual body. What do you think that, that verse means in Romans where it says uh, you're buried with Him in baptism, you're raised to walk in the of life. When it says we died with Him and we were raised again. What, what does that mean? You know, when we're lost, are we a spiritual body? When we get saved, do we become a spiritual body? And if so, when? Uh, it goes on, it says there's a natural body and there's a spiritual body. And, it's, and so it is written. The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last man, Adam, became a life-giving spirit. When did he become a life-giving spirit? Hello? Colossians 1, 16. It says, For by Him all things were created that are in heaven that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through Him and for Him. He is before all things and in all things, and in Him all things consist. He is the head of the body of the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Now I have a question for you. If he's the firstborn, how can he be the firstborn from the dead when he's not the first person that was raised from the dead? Uh -huh. I think
think too often when we think about the resurrection, we think about his body being raised. And whether it's conscious or subconscious, until we come to the realization that he was a human being and gave up his, his godship to come and live on this earth in a human body. And, and when he was raised from the dead, he was the per first person that was raised from spiritual death. That made him the firstborn among many brethren. And I don't know about y'all, maybe I knew that at some level, but not in my consciousness, not in my understanding of really. it. But, uh, and he was, he was the firstborn from the dead that in all things he may have preeminence. Do you understand what preeminence means? Uh, he wants to be first in your life. He doesn't want to be first in your life. He wants to be your life. He wants to be your life. In Him we live and move and breathe and have our being. He wants to be everything in your life. He wants to replace the you in your life with Him. He wants you to so submit to Him, so surrender to Him, so listen to His voice, that you do and say the things that He wants you to do and say. He wants to live His life out through us. He does the majority of His work on this earth through us. Hello? Are we doing it? How many of you try? How many of you know we're not really doing it the way we're supposed to? Hello? I'm glad I'm not alone. Don't give me great comfort. 1 Corinthians 15, again 46. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterwards the spiritual. The first man of the earth was made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. And he was the man of dust, and as was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. How many of y'all were made out of dust? Along with that, hello? And he was reproduced, reproduced, reproduced. He still came from the dust until Jesus got him. Thank you. Uh, As is the first heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. How do you get to be heavenly? You become a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things pass away. All things become new. When does that happen? It happens when you meet the living Lord Jesus Christ, the life-giving Spirit. Amen. That's when it happens. And as we have borne the image of the old man of dust, Y'all paying attention to this? This is critical. As we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man, Christ Jesus. When do we bear that image? How many of you feel like you're living up to that image? How many of you believe that God looks at you and sees that image? When you really believe, listen to me, when you really believe that God sees you that way, and when you begin to agree with the word that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and you are sinless, and you're free from the penalty of sin and death, and you're free from the law of sin and death, you know what's going to happen? You're going to start acting a lot more like it. Will you ever be perfect in this body? I don't think so. I don't think so. They used to preach that you could be sinless perfection a long time ago. And I think what God was trying to do was to get us to understand that in His eyes, He makes us the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And we begin to distort it. And, and people begin to think, well, if I, if I strain real hard and I try real hard and I stay full of the Spirit all the time, I can let, I heard one guy talk about it years and years and years and years ago. He said, man, I'll live sinless for a whole day. Well, hallelujah. What would you do the next day? Yeah. <laughs> How would you like to live from going to heaven whether you could be sinless for one day or two days or three days or a week? Hello? But see, he took us out from under the law of sin and death. Read it in Romans. When you come to Jesus, you're no longer under the law of sin and death. Are you still going to mess up? Sure, you're going to mess up. But you're not under the law, so God doesn't see it as sin. He sees you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He put it on you. He put away your sin when you came to Him. He put it away. And you became 
the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Do you ever get out of Christ Jesus once you're in it? No, he said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Neither life, nor death, nor powers, nor principalities, nor any other created thing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Another place he says, he's coming again without regard to sin to those that are looking forward to his coming. That means to those that have trusted him that are saved. We ought to be happy. We ought to be excited when we understand that. I mean, I can't. I lived for 50 plus years of my life without understanding that, and I knew I was saved by grace. But I thought I earned everything else, and it's just not true. God sees you as the righteousness of God. He sees you just like His Son. His Son is entitled to every blessing in the world, and you are too when you believe that and when you claim it in His name. Amen. Amen. He'll lead you in the paths of righteousness and He'll bless you. The eyes of the Lord are searching to and fro, seeking the righteous to bless them. That's what He's doing. And if you don't know you're righteous, you don't act righteous. And if you don't know you're righteous, you've got to know it. You've got to know it to enjoy it. You're still righteous if you don't know it, if you've trusted Him as your Lord and Savior. But if you don't know it, you don't enjoy it. That's where I was for a major part of my life. And, and then I got resurrected Amen. because He taught me this out of the Scripture. He woke me up one day and made me start studying. And I went from Romans to Hebrews to every place in the Bible and back and forth until in 1 John until I finally got it understood that I could not make me righteous if I worked at it for 100,000 years. It takes Him to put away the sin for me to be righteous. And then, I, I hate to tell you all this, but y'all can't do anything now. I'm going to be righteous when I die. I'm going to stand at the pearly gates. St. Peter might come and ask me, he said, why should we let you in here, Jerry? And I'm going to say, I'll tell you why. Because Jesus put away my sin. And I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now, I don't know who you are, but look over. I'm coming in. That's how you get in. Of course, you get in by, you get in by the blood of Jesus. And you, you, you need to know, I'm not a hellfire damnation preacher, but you need to know. If you get up there and you don't know the password like that, they say, I'm sorry. You know, Jesus said, and he said in the last time, people are going to be clamoring after me. And I say, you know, I'm the cowboy church, I just got a boring preacher preach, and I came to all the cowboy church, and I cooked, and I worked, and I slaved. You know, you got to let me in. And Jesus is going to look at them. No matter how hard you work, no matter how much I loved you, no matter how much the other people loved you, Jesus is going to look at you and he's going to say, and I think he's going to have a tear roll down his cheek and say, I'm sorry, I never knew you. He never came to me. He never, he never trusted me. I'm sorry, I never knew you. That's a sad thing. And I don't want anybody to leave here today thinking that they're saying and not knowing for sure. Um, 2 Corinthians 5.16 I'm almost done in case you didn't notice Therefore from now on we regard no man according to the flesh even though we have known Christ according to the flesh see when he was walking around in earthly body they knew him according to the flesh yet now we know him thus no longer because he died he was resurrected and he came back as living spirit. A living spirit with a spiritual body. Uh, so we know him no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, I want you to hear this out of God's word to know that I'm not just saying it. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. You become a spiritual being. You become a heavenly thing. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Hallelujah. You've got some things in your life you want to get rid of? Come to Jesus. Amen. And, if, and if you've come to Jesus and those things are still bothering you, learn this lesson and tell the devil you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. You ain't tolerating that stuff anymore. You ain't thinking right. about that stuff anymore. It's gone. Right. Amen. Yeah. Stay out of the way from it and leave it in the dirt where it belongs, okay? Sorry. Not really. I'm not, I'm not. Don't be sorry. I don't want to be excited when y'all are. Oh, yeah. Be excited. Really. 
Uh, behold, all things have become new. All things are of God, who has reconciled us to Himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to Himself. Y'all, open your ears right now. Not imputing their trespasses to them. Hi, yeah. When you mess up, He doesn't impute it to you. Because Amen. you're not under the law. It's put away. It's done with. It's over. Rejoice in the fact that He is resurrected and you are resurrected with Him. We're raised to walk in newness of life. And has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for me and for you, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him forever. Away. You can't mess it up. You can't get it dirty. You can you can mess your life up. You can make bad choices and bad decisions, and you can reap some things that you sow, and you can be a mess. But not in God's eye. Not if you really trust in Him. You really believe that that He's able to put away your sin and that He forgave your sin. You can you can mess yourself up, but but you're not messed up in His eyes. Do you believe that? You've got to believe that if you want all the good things that God has for you. And when you when you get that, guess what? You quit making so many bad decisions and you quit making bad choices because you're going to start listening to His voice. You're going to get so full of excitement, so full of gratitude over what you found out that He did for you that you're going to want to do things different. You're going to start studying His words. You're going to get hungry <clears throat> for a relationship with Him. You're going to want to know Him better. You're going to want more of Him in your life until He's got all of you. Until you're totally surrendered to Him. And then you know what's going to happen? One day you're going to be walking down the street. And that's all going to hit you at one time. And you're going to say, Whoa! Hallelujah! Glory! I'm telling you, you get excited. You have fun when you really know who you are in Christ Jesus. That's the message the world needs to have right now. That's the thing that will save our country. If enough Christians get so excited because Jesus loves them and made them righteous, We'll start voting for righteous people. And we'll start putting righteous people in office. And next thing you know, we'll have a righteous president. And next thing you know, we'll be a godly country again. And the next thing you know, we'll be respected in the world because of God. And God Amen. will do it because God is God. Amen? If, if you're visiting here today, by the way, I, I don't always have this much fun preaching. <laughs> well, I hope some of you do. But uh, let me see. Romans six five. No, I got two more to go. So, First John four. Oh, sorry. First uh, John four nineteen. No, First John four. Seventeen. Seventeen. Yeah. He has been. Perfected. It, love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Why? Because, listen to this, listen folks, because as He is, so are we when we get to heaven. No. No, in this, in world. this world right now. Right. Now, i got a question. It says, as He is. Now this was, this was written in 1 John. This was way after the the resurrection and the ascension and the disciples and all of that. How was he then? As he is then, he is now, okay? Now how is he now? How is Jesus now? Lord of Lords. He's resurrected. He lives in us. He's at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. He's the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? As he is, so are we in this world right now. Amen. I can't preach in any plain. If you don't get it, I'll be glad to go over with you again in private. Uh, Romans 6, 5. For we have been united together in the likeness of His death. Are you listening? Certainly, we also shall be 
in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing that our old man was crucified with him. What was the old man? Sin. The old man was a sinner. The old man was dead spiritually. Knowing this, our old man was crucified with him that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been... Come on. Free. Even better than that. Better what? Free. Free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe we shall also live with Him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over Him. You know what else you get? Death no longer has dominion over you. Amen. Because you're a spiritual being. Okay? Your body's going to die. Yes. Yes. But you are never going to real you, your spirit man, your spiritual person, your spiritual body is never going to know death. You better, you know, when, when you shut your eyes, do you know when you went to sleep? I was awake most of the night last night, and and I I, I, I must have gone. To, I, I was asleep when the alarm went off. The last time I saw the clock, it was like three thirty, and I had the alarm set for five. So I know when the alarm went off, I went to sleep, but I don't know when I went. That's what death's going to be like for a Christian. That's it. You're going to shut your eyes. And the minute this body stops breathing, you're going to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you never will have died. Your body will die, but you never will have died. That's what it's saying. Is that good or is that good? You want to live knowing that? And you also live knowing that you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and He loves you no matter what you do. And you start acting like, like that. Yeah. Automatically, it'll happen. I promise you. I'm not perfect, but you should have known me before I before I learned that. Amen. <laughs> Ask somebody that knew me. Uh, now, if we die with Christ, we believe we should also live with Him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over Him. For the death He died, He died to sin once for all. Let me tell you a secret. When He died to sin once for all, once you come to Him, you died to sin once, once for, all. for all. Amen. For all your life. You didn't die for it for everybody else like He did. He died for sin once for all for everybody. But He says we died with Him, we were raised with Him, and He put away the sin. So you are dead to sin once for all. Period. Paragraph. Exclamation point. So, But the life he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. You know what reckon means? What does it mean? It means take this. Take your thoughts captive. Renew your mind. Believe what God says. And plug it in up here. And erase everything else and, and, and stop listening to the devil when he tells you how rotten you are and how many things you've done. Tell him to go to. <laughs> That's the only time it's legitimate to say that. To say uh -huh. that to go home. Tell him. Say, get out. I don't believe that anymore. My mind doesn't believe that. It's not true. It's a lie from you, and I don't believe your lies anymore. And I renew my mind and I make my mind believe what God says. And I practice it over and over and over. And I do that by meditating day and night on these parts of the Word until I get them in my spirit, until I know them by heart. And when you start believing them, then your life changes more and more and more. And it's a never-ending process. But it's one you'll enjoy and you'll love the more you can believe it, okay? This will drive out almost anything out of your body that causes you issues if you really believe it. <clears throat> uh, you want to say something? I just want to say like change. They can't, they can't hear you. I didn't know if you were agreeing with me. Okay. <laughs> this is what Yeah, go ahead. This is what changed this for me. Because I think we're all born in the nation of achievers. But when I heard it said, if Adam 
who is very many, had the ability to cast us all into sin. How dare we lessen who Jesus Christ was, who was the Son of God that came to take away sin. If we and ourselves could not take away sin from which man does, how can we man take ourselves out of the hand of God once we want to? Amen. Well, that's it. Amen. You know, sometimes it's scary when somebody wants to talk and do the sermon, but sometimes it's good to let them do it. Amen? Uh, it doesn't scare them when you want to talk, but... Uh, I'm almost done. I said that one ago. I really am. Uh, death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died once to sin for power. But the life he lives, he lives to God. And likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead in need to sin. And to do that, you have to reckon yourself to be alive to God in Christ Jesus. You can't do one without the other. They happen simultaneously. If you reckon yourself alive to God in Christ Jesus, you are reckoning yourself dead to sin. If you reckon yourself dead to sin, you better reckon yourself alive to God in Christ Jesus. Amen? It's got to be. Sin shall, shall have no dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Say grace. Grace. Say, I want to live under grace. Because I'm under grace. <laughs> okay, I, just, I promise this time I just got one more scripture. And I just, and I just discovered this scripture a couple of days ago. Uh, maybe two. Uh, maybe two scriptures. Uh, <laughs> Philemon 6. Listen to this now. Philemon 6. I don't know if I've ever preached a message with this much truth all in one in one block. That the communication, and, and Philemon is Paul writing to someone trying to justify a slave in that way and trying to get him to forgive the guy and treat him like a brother and all that and keep the guy out of trouble because he blessed, he blessed him. And in the middle of that, uh, that's the context that this is in, but this statement stands alone by itself. He's put all that stuff away from it. This scripture still stands, okay? Uh, that the communication of thy faith, how many of you want to communicate your faith? We should all. That the communication of your faith may become effectual. How many of you want the communication of your faith to become effectual? Okay, then read the last part of that. It says, by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. When you acknowledge the stuff I've been talking about, when you receive it, believe it, and acknowledge it, then you will become effectual at communicating your faith. Do you understand what I'm saying? And, and that word effectual means, uh, it means acting and operative. You're communicating your faith will become active and operative and effective when you start pronouncing these things we've been talking about, when you acknowledge every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. And I never get, telling, get tired of telling people, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And I don't believe it. I, I know all of y'all and some of you that know me best don't think that, that I'm really that righteous and that I'm righteous in the end. But I don't care. I'm not I'm not trusting you to get to heaven. I'm not Amen. trusting you for, for sure. I'm trusting Jesus. And he says that in his eyes I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And I guess I care a little bit what you think, but not really. You know, I mean, does that make sense? I mean, I want you to like me, I want you to think good of me, but but it don't make any difference to me if you don't. See, that's when you get to where sticks and stones won't break your bones and words won't hurt you because you know what God says you are and you receive it and you accept it. And, and you don't, you, you know, if you're real sensitive, you get out of senses. Because it doesn't matter what, what, what I think about you anymore. It doesn't Amen. matter what somebody says about you. Hello? I think I should clear that. <laughs> Last one. I could go on. If you want, if you want to know what all you've got in Christ Jesus, you can read it for yourself in Isaiah 53. Amen. That's about Jesus and everything that He says about Him. You can apply to yourself. Amen. Well, I appreciate y'all letting me go on and on and on. I certainly have fun. Amen.
And uh, I just want to offer you the opportunity before we quit. Uh, if you've never trusted Jesus as your personal Savior, you're missing out on all that system. You're missing out on going to heaven unless you do it before you die. You're missing out. But the main thing is, is you're missing out on life now. Jesus came that you might have life and have it right So if there's anybody in here who doesn't, and, and you know, in my case, I was saved as a little bitty kid, seven years old or so. And, and when I got to be 30 and I was experiencing troubles in my life, the preacher asked me if I was saved. And I said, well, I think so. I'm pretty sure I got saved. And I couldn't tell him why. The Lord what saved me. It was too far back. I've been running away from God for 15 years. And so he said, well, what I'd like to do with guys like you is say, if never before prayer. So if you have any doubt, if you think you've been saved, but you've got a question in your mind and you're not truly sure, you can do like I do. You can pray, pray if never before prayer. Because you, you can only get saved once, okay? You only pray this prayer once. But it's okay if you've got some doubts to drive the devil away by saying, God, if never before, I want to drive a stake in the ground. I'm going to go down and I can remember it. I can write the day down. And I can get a witness and a testifier to, to, with me that, that I got saved today. So if that's you and you want to do that, I want to lead you in a never before prayer right now. Okay? So if that's you, just pray this prayer. Just say, Father, if never before, right this minute, I choose to trust you as my Lord and my Savior. I know you're the Son of God. I know that God raised you from the dead. And I want you to, to be part of my life. I want to receive you into my life. I want to get to know you better. And I want you to show me what you put me here for. And show me why I'm here on this earth. And show me what you want me to do. And I'll try to do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I've already told you before, if you prayed for today, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, Right now, you are a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things pass away. All things become new. You're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. But it's really, really good for you to confirm it. And not for my benefit, but for your own benefit. It's good for you to raise your hand and say, I prayed that prayer and I made it with my whole heart. I'm going to it for him. Anybody wants to make that confession anyway? Amen. Amen. Angels of heaven, the answer is two. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's good to three. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 I hope you're helping, but I really appreciate y'all coming today because I had a really good time. I'm, I'm, I'm not sorry either. Uh, any of y'all that, uh, that learned anything about righteousness want to, want to confess your righteousness and, and uh, start believing it and living it and confessing it? Increase your witness. Anybody? Everyone. one. Two, three, four, six, seven. All right, y'all pray with me. Just say, Father, thank you that you made me the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And Father, right now, I choose to believe it, whether I ever understood it perfectly before or not. Right now, I choose to accept the fact that I am your child. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You love me. You will never forsake me. You don't see my sin. You put away sin from me. And, and I believe it, and I receive it right now. It's never before. So, Father, help me to get excited about studying this part of your word and learning more about my righteousness and learning more about your love and your grace and your mercy. And help me to, to just keep putting you on and putting you on and putting you on and realizing that you're in me and I'm in you. And that I am righteous because of you, because of your shed blood. Father, help me to know it and be able to preach it to others, Father. Help it to make my witness a, a real witness for you as I live it and breathe it and walk it, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you prayed that, raise your hand and say hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Man, we're coming to church today. How do you know when you've been in a cowboy church? How? How? You come back now, you hear?